This presentation is on forearm fractures uh, from the Orthopedic Trauma Association Core Curriculum uh, Resident Lecture Series, uh, version 4. Um, I'm Sake Brahman. I'm going to be narrating this. Uh, and this is a presentation created by uh, Dr. Derek Donegan over at UPenn. Uh, and the previous author was Dr. Stephen Rabin. So um, let's get into it. So what's the problem? Well, um, Adult forearm fractures are inherently unstable, right? especially when you have uh, both bones and usually with yeah, even the radius alone. O only certain isolated ulna fractures uh, are predictably, uh, you know, are, are potentially predictably stable. Uh, according to AO Documentation Center, um, uh, forearm fractures were 10 to 14 percent uh, within that time period, 1980 to 96. Uh, and unfortunately, mistreatment can lead to malunions and nonunions, which not only are cosmetically unappealing, but functionally impeding. So this is the thing. And, and, and a lot of people teach that a forearm fracture has to be treated to some degree like an articular fracture in that anatomic reduction uh, is uh, necessary in order to rest, uh, restore uh, the, the you know, appropriate uh, uh, function to the upper extremity and that is because uh, uh, you have this phenomenon with the radial bow uh, being necessary and critical for a rotation as is shown here uh, and if you're familiar with the anatomy this should make sense uh, there's an interosseous membrane that tethers the distal ulna to the proximal radius and travels along the course of the forearm um, some of the neurovascular structures you should be uh, aware of and uh, familiarize yourself with certainly are the radial nerve, pro uh, the uh, deep motor branch is the pro uh, posterior interosseous nerve, which you will encounter uh, with some of the uh, uh, dorsal approaches proximally. And then there's a superficial um, uh, sensory branch uh, distally. Uh, the radial artery sits uh, just deep to the brachioradialis. And the median nerve uh, courses uh, along the forearm as well, as does the ulnar nerve. Median nerve sits in the midline. Uh, it becomes superficial uh, within the carpal tunnel, and it has the motor, uh, motor branch of the anterior interosseous uh, nerve along their interosseous membrane. So forearm fractures can be either from low energy or high energy. Uh, low energy could be a direct blow, like a nightstick fracture, where you have sort of an isolated ulna shaft fracture, or it could be indirect, where uh, there's, uh, for instance, a load directly onto an outstretched hand, uh, and you have uh, indirect trauma to the forearm, resulting in uh, um, fractures of both bones, or you could get uh, a radius fracture with distal radio ulnar joint dislocation, which is the galeazzi, or the ulna fracture with proximal radial ulnar joint dislocation uh, of the radial head essentially uh, which is the montasia lesion okay and of course high energy injuries you have to look for associated injuries uh, be more careful about neurovascular injury and compartment syndrome and obviously these can be open so physical exam findings um, usually is somewhat apparent uh, both bones fractured will lead to gross instability uh, there'll be pain. You have to make sure you assess the elbow and wrist, right, a joint above and joint below, as well as a neurovascular exam. And uh, particular attention to the anterior interosseous nerve, posterior interosseous nerve, and the uh, arterial supply. And of course, uh, the forearm is a location where compartment syndrome can occur, um, similar to the lower leg. So you really have to Pay close attention to the compartments and when in doubt, um, uh, potentially uh, check compartment pressures if uh, there's a concern about compartment syndrome that's not clinically clear. Um, so what about those compartments? Well, there's the dorsal compartment that includes the extensors, right? So that's pretty much here, okay? And then there's the uh, volar flexors, not shown well here. Uh, and then there's the mobile wad, right? So that's your 
over here, okay? Um, so let me come back here a second. So uh, when you do fasciotomies, for instance, you'll typically do, uh, the most popular approach would be to do you know, one uh, incision uh, dorsally to get the extensor compartment. And then the second incision is gonna be on the volar side uh, and you may have to you know, strategically place your incision in case you need to cross the midline, I'm sorry, cross the wrist crease and the elbow crease. But typically you come down the middle, you uh, expose the volar compartment, and then you curve over radially to get the mobile wad at the same time. So it's sort of a, a lazy ass curvilinear to almost uh, incision. Okay, here's a dorsal uh, compartment release um, for fasciotomy. Um, of course, compartment syndrome is going to be pain with passive extension, uh, pain out of proportion. Um, these can occur more often with high energy injuries, and of course, um, fasciotomies are indicated. Typically, two incisions, although you have to make sure you get the mobile wad, uh, and when necessary, you may need to extend to a carpal tunnel release. So, assessment continues with uh, radiographic workup. Um, plain radiographs, joint above and joint below, and it's really important. This is actually where um, you know you will potentially miss a DRUJ dislocation, a radial head dislocation, and you don't want to be that person who misses it. So make sure you image a joint above and joint below. Uh, CT, MRI scans are usually not needed. Um, this is one area where we, we, I think you very rarely um, We'll have to, to do that, and I guess that's the case with a lot of diaphyseal fractures. AO classification uh, can be utilized here. So this is the second, uh, so uh, this is a, a bone number two, okay? And then a mid-diaphysis would be also a number two. This becomes a 22. And then you can have uh, these different combinations involve, uh, depending on which bone is fractured and what uh, type of fracture you have. All right, so uh, type A would be a simple fracture uh, such as one of these combinations. Um, example would be shown here, transverse radius fracture with, um, and perhaps it looks like there may be some disruption of the distal radial ulnar joint if you look very carefully here. Type B would be a, technically a wedge fracture. Um, so you can have the ulna alone, radius alone, or both bones. So here's both bones fracture, which is pretty common. This is a very typical appearance for a forearm fracture. You have that type. And then complex fractures, um, either of each bone or both bones. And here's a sort of metaphyseal both bones fracture. Um, but nevertheless, uh, um, this is falls into that category, I think. Although you may also call this a periarticular uh, fracture. Perhaps you would call this a 23A. But anyhow, I, to be honest, I don't think uh, AOT classification is used in common speak amongst surgeons, at least that I'm uh, that I converse with for the forearm. I mean, it's very useful in many other fractures, um, but um, uh, I'll leave it at that. So non-operative treatment uh, certainly can be uh, employed, but um, only for very select fractures. So. Uh, again, this is, like I said, you're going to treat them almost like articular fractures, right? So non-operative treatment uh, really only has a role for completely non-displaced fractures um, for the most part. So, uh, and, and, and certain ulna fractures, I should say. So, um, in the ulna, um, if you have a fracture that's less than 10 degrees angulated and... Um, has uh, greater than 50% cortical um, apposition or display, you know, dis overall displacement. Uh, like very many nightstick fractures, these can be treated non-operatively and uh, very frequently they are actu actually. Um, but uh, when you have both bones fractured, it's almost always an operative case. Now the radius, if it's truly, you know, really non-displaced, uh, and radial bow is maintained, then you can treat them non-operatively and watch them carefully. Um, but, uh, you know, non-operative management is mostly relegated to nightstick fractures, 
uh, and very non-displaced uh, radius fractures. All right, so um, I'm going to pause there, and we'll pick up on operative management and surgical approaches in the uh, uh, next part of this uh, presentation. Thanks.